chapter 1 We had come to verse 14 the last time, so I'll continue reading from verse 14. I'm reading in a Darby translation. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have contemplated His glory, a glory as of an only begotten with a Father full of grace and truth. John bears witness of him, and he has cried, saying, This was he of whom I said, He that comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. For of his fullness we all have received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given by Moses, grace and truth subsist through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father. He has declared Him. And this is the witness of John, when the Jews sent from Jerusalem priests and Levites, that they might ask him, Thou, who art thou? And he acknowledged and denied not, and acknowledged, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he says, No, I am not. Art thou the prophet? And he answered, No. They said therefore to him, Who art thou? That we may give an answer to those who sent us. What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the path of the Lord, as said Isaiah the prophet. And And they were sent from among the Pharisees. And they asked him and said to him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou art not the Christ, nor Elias, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water. In the midst of you stands whom ye do not know, he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to unloose. These things took place in Bethany, across the Jordan where John was baptizing. I wanted to continue till verse 36, but I don't think we have enough time for that. We'll see. This is a wonderful portion. And we have seen the last time, when we started with John's Gospel, how this is a very deep, very rich, and at the same time very simple language. Very simple. We have seen, at the beginning, the seven <coughs> pillars would connected with the person of the Lord. He is so great. We have seen in the beginning was the Word. And then these seven points we have seen in verse 1 through uh, 5. He was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And then He was in the beginning with God. And then the fifth point, all things received being through Him. Without Him no one not one thing received being which was has received being and then in verse 4 in him was life that's the sixth point and the life was the light of man that's the seven points so how great he is and then we have seen uh, John's witness there was a man sent from God that is the first reference to John the Baptist as a witness there are many references in chapter 1 to John's witness Here is the first one. A man sent from God. And I'd like to make an application. The Lord has sent us into this world as believers. Is everybody here really a believer? If so, you are sent by God into this world. We are all sent. And so we need to realize this mission that each one of us has. No one can compare himself with John the Baptist. He was the greatest of all prophets. But this we have in common with John, that God has also sent us into this world. We see that later in John 20, the Lord will speak about it, over in John 17 in his prayer to the Father. And then it says in verse 7, he came for witness. He was a witness. And there is also a parallel with us. We are left in this scene to be witnesses. 
not Jehovah's Witnesses, but Witnesses of Jehovah, because the Lord Jesus is Jehovah. So we are His Witnesses. And then the purpose was that all might believe through Him. John had a very special uh, uh, calling, a very special mission. He was the forerunner of the Messiah. And that then, when He would come, all would believe through Him, the Messiah. And then it makes it clear in verse 8, to make no mistake, He was not the light. John was the greatest of all prophets, but He was not the light. But He was a witness concerning the light, verse 8. And then in distinction to John, verse 9 says, the true light, and notice the word true is a key for this uh, book. There is much emphasis on what is true, what is real, what is genuine. So the true light was that which coming into the world lightens every man. There is a lot of counterfeit light, but here we have the true light, the Lord Jesus. And he exposes everything, verse 9, coming into the light, lightens every man. He sheds light on every person. You cannot hide from that light. Psalm 139 shows that very clearly. Uh, when you try to hide from that light, you can't. That light will expose everything. And if there is something in our lives that is not right, that light exposes it. And we need to deal with it according to that light that shows what is not right. So he lightens every man. That is very solemn. And then we have seen the last time what a great privilege this is to receive him. He was not received by his own, that, that means the Jews, but how great a privilege. There were some, a remnant, that received him. And now this is not limited to a remnant among the Jews. Now it says in verse 12, as many as received him. That phrase, as many, returns many times in this book. It, this grace cannot be limited to the Jews only. This is for everyone who believes. As many as received Him. Well, how do you receive Him? Through faith. That is explained in verse 12. He gave them the right to be children of God. Not sons, but children of God. Children of God means you represent God with light. You represent God with love. And those are the ones that believe on His name. That put their trust in His name. Everybody here already put his trust in the name of the Lord Jesus, believed on his name. That is a great privilege. Put your trust in him, not in yourself, not in an organization or in the brethren, but in him. Put your trust in him. And that means also you are attracted to him. Believing on him means you are attracted to him. You have seen that he surpasses everything else. And we put our trust in him. And those who do that... They are not born of blood, it's not a human relationship, it's not a carnal relationship, it is not according to the flesh, it's not man's will, it is born of God. He is the true source. And our believing and God's work go together, what God has wrought. But from our side, we come into this through faith. And then we are introduced into things that are so wonderful. This portion, verse 14 to verse 18, is so rich we could spend, we will spend eternity meditating, of course, on the whole word of God. But this portion is so rich. But I, I want to repeat what I said the last time. The word became flesh. We have seen in verse 1, he was. You can, you can go back as far as you want in time. He was always there. He was. He is the eternal God. But then, He came into a new condition. He remained God. He did not lose anything of what He was in taking a place that He had never before. This is described in Philippians 2. You can make notes and uh, look it up at home. Philippians 2 describes this stoop. He came down. There are seven steps in that stoop that ended at the death of the cross. And then there are seven parts in how God elevated him. God lifted him up. Here the word became flesh. That was something entirely new. What he was not before, but what he will always remain. He will always be in manhood. 
he will always maintain that form of a servant. He is in the form of God, he never lost that, Philippians 2. He took upon himself the form of a servant and he will always keep that. So the word became flesh and that will never change, he will always be that. And so that is not the flesh of verse 13, where you have the flesh, the will of the flesh. There the flesh is connected with sinful man. But here, the flesh means the condition in which the Lord came. And that's a great mystery. Uh, 1 Timothy 3, verse 16, sums it up. Uh, the one manifested in the flesh. God manifested in the flesh. That is a great mystery. But he was without sin. He knew no sin. He was apart from sin. He did not, committed no sin. Nothing... And there is a passage that is very difficult to understand, but that helps us to uh, get the point in Romans 8. He came in likeness of sinful flesh. So there is, the word became flesh. Uh, Romans 8 verse 3 says, What the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. The Lord Jesus became the sin offering, ultimately. But here on this earth, while he was a man on this earth, he was in, as this verse says it, in the likeness of sinful flesh. But that appearance is, if we think that he had anything to do with flesh, we are, big, we are greatly mistaken. It was without sin, apart from sin. And so this is how close he came to where we were, yet totally separate from sin. And then he became the sin offering after his life of perfection. Then at the cross, when he was forsaken of God, he became the sin offering. We will see more about that in John 3, when we see how the Lord said to Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent on the pole, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. So there we see him as the sin offering. And so he had to come into, the word had to become flesh, so that ultimately he could die. And of course he will remain in the flesh, because in resurrection he is still in flesh, but then he cannot die anymore. So that's a whole theme to consider. And in Galatians 4 we see how God sent his son born from a woman. So that is to show how close he came where we are and yet he was without sin. That is a great mystery. And also that he gave himself then as a sin offering for us. It's a mystery of love. That is his greatness. But that we will see later in this uh, wonderful gospel. And it says now, he dwelt among us. <coughs> there is a very special word that's only used in John's writings, I think about six times, and that reminds us of the tabernacle in the wilderness. In the tabernacle in the wilderness you see God who dwelt among his people. And that is the same thought that you have here in this word. He dwelt among us. He tabernacled among us. That word is also connected with the word Shekinah. You have, probably you have heard the expression the Shekinah glory. That comes from this same root. It means where God dwells. And where God dwells is glory. When God revealed himself in the Shekinah glory, it was the visible manifestation of his glory. And here we have the visible manifestation of God's glory. But it was veiled through the flesh. That he came, that the word became flesh, that veiled his glory as God. But it is a wonderful mystery to see how God and man in one person are seen here. And this is, beloved, a mystery that we will consider forever and ever. Colossians 1 verse 19 says that the fullness of the Godhead, the fullness, the Godhead is not mentioned there, that's in chapter 2, but the fullness means the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit dwelt in Him. And in Colossians 2 verse 9 it says that the fullness of the Godhead now, I add the word now myself, but to give the difference, now in the glory, the fullness of the Godhead dwells in Him. That shows His greatness in the man. And that is why the word became flesh and He will always remain that. Even in the glory now, He is a man at God's right hand and in Him we see the fullness of God's glory. We see the Father revealed, the Son revealed, the Holy Spirit revealed. 
Wonderful. And then there is a little parenthesis here to go back to John 1 verse 14. We have contemplated His glory. This is the we of the believing remnant. This is not the general uh, people. We'll see many times in John's Gospels statements, we know, and that is the pretentious religious leaders. Their we is not good. But the we that we have here represents the believing remnant. We have contemplated His glory. And this is what we may do, beloved, from moment to moment, always, that will continue always, this contemplation through faith, contemplation of His glorious person. How greatly we are privileged. In the Old Testament, the glory was inside, in the holy place, in the holy of holiest. No one could ever go there. No one. Except for the high priest only once a year that he could enter there. But Hebrews 10 explains that we have this free access. We can go and see his glory, right there. We see Him crowned with glory and honor. Hebrews 2 verse 9. How privileged we are. We can go and be in His presence, contemplate His glory all the time. And this is the privilege that the disciples had when they contemplated the Lord Jesus. They contemplated His glory. And one of them writes in 1 John, I'll just quote that, in 1 John 1. One of these we, and this is the writer of course, John 1, written by the Apostle John. The Apostle John, the we that he uses here, we find also in 1 John 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. See, that is the privilege that the Apostles had. They saw the Lord on this earth. But now the Lord is in the glory. And then he revealed himself to Saul of Tarsus. And Saul of Tarsus was privileged then to be, become the apostle of the Lord as he is now in the glory. And so with Paul, we also can say, we have contemplated his glory. Now through the Holy Spirit, whom we have received, through the rest of the New Testament, we also see His glory. It's not only the apostles who were with Him while He was on this earth. We may now see Him as He is in the glory at God's right hand. So in that sense, it's even a greater privilege than the apostles had at the moment that they saw the Lord on this earth. We have even brought, been brought closer to Him now. That is in connection with Paul's ministry, but that is not the subject here. And then he continues to say in this parenthesis, a glory as of an only begotten with a father. Now here we have to make very clear that is a glory that the Lord Jesus has and that is only, only belongs to him. What I just mentioned is glory that we can see. Glory that they saw on this earth. The, the remnant, the believing remnant, glory that Paul saw in heaven, the Lord Jesus at God's right hand. That is what we can contemplate also. But the glory of this relationship that we have here, glory as of an only begotten with a Father, full of grace and truth, we cannot really fully comprehend that, because the Lord Jesus is a divine person. And here we see Him as the Son of the Father. In Second John there is an expression that is only once used in the New Testament, the Son of the Father. He is what we are talking about here, the only begotten with the Father. John's, you can make a note and search it out in John's writings, he uses this five times, the only begotten, that is the unique Son of the Father, the only begotten. That means God has no one beside him. He's the unique Son of God. And so here we see the eternal Son, the Son of the Father. The word eternal is not mentioned in the Scripture, but that, that is inherent. We have seen already in chapter 1, verse 1. He always was, so He is eternal. And in that sense, He is the eternal Son, and there is the eternal Father. But the emphasis in this verse is the relationship between the Father and the Son, the only begotten Son of the Father, the Eternal Son. And that is also in verse 18, at the end of this paragraph. So how great is His person? And this 
great person has revealed himself and we can see now something of this glory because that's what John says here we have contemplated his glory a glory as of an only begotten with the father so the relationship in itself is unique the unique son of the father yet we may contemplate his glory later in the new testament you see in Paul's ministry that the Lord Jesus is the head of a new generation the head of a new family there you see him as the firstborn, also five times. He's the firstborn among many brethren. He's the firstborn of the new creation, firstborn of the, uh, those who are risen, and so on. So the firstborn, there the Lord Jesus is the head in connection with a company. But when he is the unique, he is the only begotten, that is what he is only himself, totally unique, which he cannot share with us. That is the point here in verse 14. But yet we may contemplate this glory. As we may contemplate God's glory, contemplate the glory of the Father through the Lord Jesus, we may now contemplate the glory of the only begotten with the Father, because He has revealed Himself. He has come into the flesh. So we are on holy ground here, but we are also very privileged that we may look upon Him and contemplate Him in order to worship Him. And then you have another testimony here, there's another parenthesis in verse 15 about John. John bears witness of him. So there we have the witness again, the, the one who gave testimony. And he has cried saying, this was he of whom I said, he that comes after me is preferred before me. That means in time the Lord Jesus came six months after John the Baptist. But he is preferred before me, that means he is of a higher rank, of a higher order, in verse 15. The word that's used there is protos, first. And it's very interesting, um, there is no one in the New Testament who is called protos, that's only the Lord Jesus, he is the first. And that is the meaning here of the word preferred. He is preferred before me. It means he is above me. He is the first. Not in time here. Of course the Lord Jesus was before time began. But as far as his coming into the flesh. As far as time is concerned. Time wise he came in after John the Baptist. And yet he is greater than John the Baptist. He is over him. He is preferred. He is the first. He is the protos. That is the point that John is making here in verse 15. And then in verse 16. He continues the thought. You see the end of verse 14, full of grace and truth, I did not mention that, but I'll do it now, is connected with verse 16, for of his fullness. You see there you have the two times that thought of fullness. So the end of verse 14, full of grace and truth. So it is a vessel completely filled. There's no room for anything else. It's full of grace and truth. How great He is. And this grace and truth, this represents what God is. God is love. There you have grace, the expression of love in grace. But God is also light. And there you have truth. He is full of truth. And later in John 14, the Lord says, I am the truth. So He is God blessed over all. And He is full of grace and truth. They we have a wonderful balance. That balance was always there in the Lord Jesus. But how wonderful it is. First grace. If he would have come first as truth, he would have consumed everything. Everything that was not in order, not in harmony with God. But grace comes first. But grace always maintains God's truth. Main, uh, grace will never compromise God's truth there is a divine balance and so from that fullness and that's now the point in verse 16 for of his fullness we all received there again the we is the believing remnant and it is we all it is all the apostles those twelve uh, Matthias re replaced um, Judas of course the twelve but it is the believing remnant we all have received and now today we can say we all have received from this fullness and what is so remarkable with this fullness 
it never gets diminished. It remains always a complete fullness that is only possible with God. This fullness is so great, so wonderful, that the more we draw upon it, the more we take from it, the more we receive from it, it can never diminish. It's a mystery. This fullness, what we find in the Lord Jesus, this fullness of grace and truth, we can draw from it, and we need it so much, we need a lot of grace, we need His wisdom, we need the truth, we need His balance, and we draw from Him, and we receive, for of His fullness we all have received, and it never diminishes. Grace upon grace. So also, when we look back in our lives, we see grace after grace. God's faithfulness. Grace after grace. It is a, it's such a rich supply. You make a note and read the end of Ephesians 3, where Paul is praying to the Father. And then we see this fullness. This fullness is so wonderful. We receive from it and it remains full. It never gets empty. It never get, diminishes. There is this fullness. Here, of course, in connection with the Lord while He was on earth. In Ephesians 3, the fullness connected with him, with him as He is now in the glory. We all have received. We are the recipients. How wonderful to be a recipient of this fullness. And again, I ask this question, is everyone here receiving from this fullness? Not only that you must be a believer in order to receive, but we also have to be in the right spiritual condition to be a receiver. So that is a challenge that the Lord places before each one of us, that we will be always in the right condition in order to be able to receive from Him. We can become in a very carnal position, condition, or very selfish, or very self-willed. And then we close ourselves to these resources. Then God cannot give, because we close ourselves, because of that hardened condition. But when we are in the right spiritual condition, we continue to receive and receive grace upon grace. And then he makes the contrast with what was before. During a time, God has tested man through the law of Moses, and especially his earthly people, Israel. They received that law. Verse 17. It was given. That doesn't mean that Moses was the lawgiver. He was the uh, communicator. The law was given through him. God used Moses, but God gave that law. That was holy and righteous and good, was righteous requirements. But that was not the, revel the revelation of what God really is, as we find here with the Lord Jesus. He really revealed what God is. The law could never do that. The law gave righteous commandments, and they were good and holy. But the law could never reveal what God is in Himself. God is love. The law could not reveal that. And there is a second contrast, what we see then with Moses. Not only the contrast between law on the one hand, and grace on the other hand, and the, the contrast also that the law was given by Moses, but then we see the grace and truth subsist or continue to exist. Or how does it in the uh, King James? It says came. But you have to um, read the note in the Darby version that is very helpful where it says. That's a long note, so I, you can read it on your own. But to explain the difference between what was and what became, and also what subsists. What is so interesting in this verse, in verse uh, 17, it came through him, that's of course true, but it continues to subsist through him. And there you have that balance of grace and truth, it's always there. And the verb is in the singular. Um, in other languages, when you have uh, here in English, you cannot see the difference so much. Grace and truth, yeah, you could say it this way. Grace and truth subsisted through him. In itself, that would be a right, uh, right uh, statement. But it is something that continues to exist. And not only grace and truth subsisted and will subsist, it is one it cannot be separated as a verb in the singular form. That means the plural, grace and truth, are put together and they cannot be separated. They subsist. It subsists. 
the two subsists. It doesn't make sense grammatically to say that two subsists, but that is really the point. It is one. Like you have in Genesis 1 verse 1, the Trinity, God created, God, plural, Elohim, created, singular. God's, literally, created, singular. Grammatically that doesn't make sense, but that is to show the truth of the Trinity. And here this is to show the truth of the person of the Lord, that this grace and truth can never be separated. It is there all the time, and it subsists, and it is inseparable. So, this is what we find in his life. He always maintained God's truth, and while doing it, he did it in grace. So, love and truth go together with the Lord Jesus. Love and light go together. They are inseparable. And this is how God wants it to be with our lives also. That this grace and truth cannot be separated. That we may follow the Lord Jesus in this path. So this is the greater than Moses. Moses was great. He was the lawgiver. Here is the one who is much greater than Moses. He not only gave something. He is something. See the, the tremendous difference? And then verse 18 says, No one has seen God at any time. So this is an important statement. That means God cannot be seen with human eyes. Uh, you can make a note. 1 Timothy 1 and 1 Timothy 6 speaks about this greatness of God. Especially 1 Timothy 6. That is the invisible God. And so in that sense he cannot be seen. And yet, what do we see here? The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father has declared Him. We can see the invisible God through the Lord Jesus. And the Lord Jesus is the only begotten Son. There's the second time only begotten. And then He is. He never stops being in the bosom of the Father. Just think, think about that for a moment. When the Lord Jesus was on the cross... A son, the son of man, forsaken by God, a holy and righteous God. He is at the same time the eternal son in the bosom of the Father. That is a mystery that no one can fathom. The Lord says in John 16, the Father is with me. The Father will always be with him. But as a human being, and the Lord will always be a human being, as I said earlier, he... The word became flesh and he will always be there. He will always be a human being, if I may use that term. But here we see him as a divine person. He is in the bosom of the Father and it will never change. That can never change. And also, secondly, being in, we could translate it this way, the Son, the only begotten Son, being in the bosom of the Father. It never stops. The one who was rich, Literally, in 2 Corinthians 9, it says, being rich. He'll never stop to be rich. But he became poor in his manifestation as a man on this earth. But as God, he remains God. He remains rich. And he remains as the Son in the bosom of the Father. Another point, in, could also be translated into the bosom of the Father. That suggests there was a communication between the Father and the Son. There was not a stagnant um, thing like once God made things and then he lets everything go but there is a communication in the, uh, of love between the father and the son that is suggested by this expression being in the bosom of the father and then being in that position it says he has declared him he has made him known that is what the Lord Jesus has done and only he could do it and he did it and that is the theme, one of the themes in this book, in this gospel, the Son of the Father who has come to declare the Father. Now very briefly about John's testimony. John was introduced in verse 7 and 8, and then also we have uh, had a comment on him in verse 15. John bears witness of him, but now we have a bit more information about that. The witness of John when he was challenged by the religious leaders. The religious leaders who pretended to know everything, they come with seven questions. That is interesting already. Verse, one, verse 19 is the first question, Thou who art thou? And verse 25, Why baptizest thou then? is the last question. That is the seventh question that they ask him. Now why did they do that? Obviously they had noticed that John was very special. They, they thought, maybe he is the Messiah. But then they wanted to be sure, so they started an investigation. 
And that is why they came with all those questions. And John answered very honestly, he did not seek any glory for himself. I am not the Christ. What then? Art thou Elias? I am not alive. Why did he ask this question, by the way? The Jews knew that before the Messiah would come, he would send Elias, Malachi 4. And so they asked this question, if he is not the Christ, maybe he is Elias, because he will come before the Messiah. No, I am not that. Are you then the prophet? Why do they refer to that? Why they ask that question? Moses had spoken about that in Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, I think, that God would send one like him, a prophet, like Moses. And Moses says, Hear ye him. And that's exactly the point that Peter makes in Acts 3, and Stephen later also, that they should listen to the prophet, because he had come. The Lord Jesus is that prophet. Of course, he is also the Messiah. But he is that prophet. And they didn't listen to him. They rejected him. How solemn. So he said, No, I am not the prophet. Verse 22, Who art thou? that we may give an answer to those who sent us. So there you see this investigation that had started. There was a formal investigation that had started. They did the same with the Lord Jesus later, this formal investigation. And then they rejected him. And so it was with John the Baptist. Ultimately they would reject him, and so they would reject the Master. What did John say then in verse 23? I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. This is wonderful, how he was identified with God. God is speaking, but he used John as his voice. So it's God's voice, and at the same time it is John speaking. This shows how closely God identified with this mission of the prophet, the greatest prophet. He was a voice crying in the wilderness. That also means he was not seeking anything for himself, he was just an instrument. And remember what I said at the beginning, this way God has also sent us into this world. Not seeking any glory for ourselves, as John did not seek any glory for himself, but just be a voice, be an instrument of blessing, to communicate. That is what God has asked us to do. And so he answered this question, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. God is the one who cried through John the Baptist. And what was the message? Make straight the path of the Lord. Make straight paths. That is a wonderful theme. God has a straight path for the believers in every generation, in every dispensation. But He also wants us to make straight paths. The two go together. God has a straight path. But are we going a straight path or are we crooked? He wants us to go on that straight path. Make a straight path and then go a straight path. And secondly, it is the path of the Lord. This path was prepared that the Lord may go through that path. That was the forerunner who would prepare the path. In those days, uh, if there would be a royal visit, the people would go and prepare the roads, make everything in order, so that the royal visit could come. That is the idea. It is in view of the presence of the Lord, the presence of the King. And Isaiah had already spoken of that, you can read in several prophecies of Isaiah. And then it says they were sent from the Pharisees, because the Pharisees, they pretended to maintain God's rights, they were very uh, zealous to maintain God's rights, but they were only seeking for their own glory, said to say. And so ultimately there will be a great conflict between them and the Lord Jesus, as we see later in this book. So then this last question, why baptizest thou then, if thou art not the Christ? See, that was very strange for the Jews, that someone would baptize. They were already the people of God, they were okay. They thought, the reason was, if you are a Jew, you are good for the millennium, you are good for the world to come. If you are a Jew, a male, circumcised, you are guaranteed a place in the world to come. That is their thinking. And many people today also think that way, well, I've been baptized, so I'm okay. So they base their conviction on a ritual, or on a certain privilege they have, and they think they are okay. Not so. That is why this was so drastic that those Jews who thought they were ready for the millennium to come, they needed to be baptized. Why was that? Because the condition in which they found themselves it was so way off from God. There was repentance needed. Now, 
That's still a message for today. There's a great difference. The baptism of John is not there anymore. But the repentance, the thought of repentance is there. Repentance, there is where it starts. But they were not willing to repent. But then John, we'll see later, he has people who uh, listen to his message. And he says in verse 26, I baptize with water. In the midst of you stands whom you do not know. See, this baptism was connected with repentance to introduce, to purify people, to set them apart from the religious profession. Through baptism you are set apart. And then John says, but this is not the whole story. I baptize with water, but it is in view of the one who is coming after me. In the midst of you he stands already, he stands there. He has taken his position there. That is... Uh, also a very interesting word that shows the greatness of the position of the Lord. He stands. Would be food for thought and for further study. Everything relies on him. He stands. He just stands. But everything depends on him. And John gives glory to him. He says, whom ye do not know. Verse 27. He who comes after me. We talked about that already earlier. In time. But John... He humbles himself before the great king. He says, The thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to unloose. See how great John honors the master. Do we honor the Lord Jesus this way? We take so many things for granted. And we easily dishonor the name of the Lord without realizing it. But John is very careful to give honor and glory to the Lord Jesus. And then the last verse for this afternoon is verse 28. These things took place in Bethany, across the Jordan. This is not Bethany where Mary and Martha and Lazarus lived. This is another Bethany at the other side of Jordan. But that emphasizes the seriousness of the situation. John had to go the other side of the Jordan River to get away from that religious system that was going to reject the Messiah anyway. And so he is already outside of that system. And they have to come to him in order to be baptized. But those religious leaders, they were not going to be baptized. We see that in the other Gospels. So this is also the position we have today, outside of the religious world. And we can also build ourselves a religious world, and then we would have to go outside again. This is outside of what man builds in his pretensions to be really with the one who has come into this world, whose paths are straight, who we may follow as we have seen here, who we may listen to his voice, we may go straight past. Let us go straight past in view of his soon coming. Let us be, uh, let us straighten things out. If there are things that have not been set right yet in our lives, we need to straighten these things out so that we can go a straight past and that through that also the king may come through us, because we represent him into this, in this world. We represent the king here in this world. And that is why we need to go straight past, because we represent the king. And so, the rest of John's testimony will have to wait till the next time, Lord willing, in verse 29 and in verse 35. But we'll stop for now here, and if there are questions of things that I have not uh, mentioned, please, let's take a few moments for that. Christ there's a reference to grace and truth in verse 14 where it says fullness of grace and truth and then but grace and truth came by the Lord Jesus Christ in contrast to law or legalism yeah. don't we see that coming out more in these um, Pharisees how they were legalists. And could it be that we too can have a spirit of legalism, of law, rules, being regimental, or is not all that contrary to the word? Yes, and I hinted on that uh, when I spoke, that we therefore need to make straight paths and may go, back, may go back to this straight path of grace and truth. Yeah. Grace and truth. Yeah. Is it proper to say that instead of the law was coming 
God in hand is communicating, but grace and truth flows to a divine person. Is it, is it right to say that? I think so. Yeah, that would be a good analysis. When God's law it communicates it, when it's grace and truth, it does not communicate, but it flows. It's there. Yeah. It's a beautiful contrast. Yes. I think this, this expression in verse 18, the bosom of the Father, and in John 14, we have the in John 14 and verse 3 says that where I am. Is this the same place? Very good question. John 14, verse 3. Is it the same place? I go and prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Okay. It's not exactly the same place, but it's very close. So when the Lord says, uh, in verse 18, it says, Who is in the bosom of the Father... It is unique. It's only something that belongs to Him. But the Father's house is of course very close. Because if the Son and the Father are there, and the Son is in the bosom of the Father, then the Father's house, of which He speaks here in John 14, is very close. Because there is where the Father and the Son are. But, so we are not brought into the bosom of the Father, because we, we are not the unique Son of the Father. It's only Him. But we have been brought very close. That's what that's all I can say. Someone said that, uh, that the bosom speak of a kind of state of intimacy and fellowship, which can never be interrupted. And yeah. it's, uh, it's not something that we can enter into. Yeah. It is that which exists between Father and Son, yeah. which we can. Yeah. But I would add to this, we have the privilege, like John, the writer of this gospel, he rested on the bosom of the Lord Jesus. You know that. And so in that sense, we have been very brought very close because we can also rest on the bosom of the Lord Jesus. So the one who is in the bosom of the Father, we can rest on His bosom. So that's why I said, that shows how close we have been brought. But we are not in the bosom of the Father as the unique Son of the Father is in the bosom of the Father. That is the difference. One more question. There are two persons in, in the Bible called, uh, we know Isaac is called the only begotten, and in the Lord Jesus Christ is called the only begotten, and you have said it has to do with the Christ is unique. So, Abram's unique son Isaac, Abram had other sons, but there was only one who was unique. In that sense, Isaac is really a type of the Lord Jesus. So, the emphasis there on the uniqueness of the relationship. In that sense, he is a type of the Lord Jesus. The fullness of the, of the grace. It says the fullness of grace. In other words, God has given us all that He can give. There is no more that God is going to give. You can nothing add to that. There is nothing else. No. The fullness of it. No. And that is what we receive in the Lord Jesus. Yes. We are greatly blessed. Are there any more questions or comments? Well, let us continue reading and meditating and contemplating till He comes, and then we will forever continue to contemplate Him. May the Lord bless His word. Thanks. Amen.